in my previous lecture I had been speaking to you about the various criticisms of Gandhi's ears in South Africa and I have mentioned to you uh, on more than one occasion that I don't think we should run away from these criticisms. That had always been the tendency and much of the Gandhi scholarship, I was, I was asked a question uh, 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 after my lecture day before yesterday at the end of class uh, about what I thought about the Gandhi film. Uh, and when I say the Gandhi film, I'm speaking about the 1982 feature film uh, made by Richard Attenborough, which you can easily access uh, through Netflix. I'm sure it's on YouTube by now. Um, and this is a kind of a heroic uh, film of heroic proportions. Everything uh, about Gandhi is of epic proportions, I have to tell you, as uh, not just the collected works of Gandhi, but the biographies, many of them run into 10 volumes, uh, uh, one single biography, you know, running into 10 volumes. Uh, and everything was very, uh, 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 very widely documented. Um, so um, the film, for example, uh, you know, is it, is it uh, accurate or not? <laughs> Uh, and I want to just take a couple of minutes, begin with that, because the film does actually, the, the Attenborough film does talk about Gandhi's South Africa years. See, I think very often it's more important to understand uh, the spirit in which something is done rather than to worry about the accuracy uh, of a representation such as a film. I'll give you two illustrations, one drawn from that film and one which is not drawn from that film. Let me begin with the latter. I am sure many of you have heard the expression and you have seen it on coffee mugs and you have seen it on t-shirts and you have seen it on stickers. Okay, be the change that you want to see in the world. Some variation of that and then it'll say Mahatma Gandhi. Now I can tell you with confidence that nowhere in the hundred volumes of the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi will you find that quotation. <laughs> I can tell you that. Okay, and yet if you just go to the internet, I'm telling you there are companies that have made a living and a killing from it, if I may use that phrase. They sell mugs, they sell stickers, t-shirts, be the change, and then Gandhi's, okay. So then somebody will say, well that's a fraud, no. Because even though he didn't say that in so many words, he could easily have said it. I can imagine him saying that. And I have hinted at that. How did I hint at it before? I suggested to you on more than one occasion that Gandhi never tried out on someone else a theory that he did not first try out on himself. That's exactly what it means. Be the change that you want to see in the world. Right? That's what it means. So, so let's, not, let's not worry about fidelity to the exact expression. And somebody would say, well, you know, Gandhi didn't say it. How come it got attributed to him? Well, that's how ideas travel. And that's how scholars make their living, by the way. All right? You, you, you consider these things. You know, one doesn't have to be an empiricist about everything. The second illustration, I got a query by email, a very interesting query from a professor, not of Indian studies, but of something else, who had been watching my YouTube lectures and, and you know, and knew about the fact that I had written on Gandhi. And the query was the following, that in the Attenborough film of 1982, you have a scene towards the end. And you'll understand the context of that scene much better in the second half of the class, but even now you can understand it, though you don't really know much about what was happening in the 40s, but this is shortly before India acquired independence. And you had communal rights. You had Muslims and Hindus killing each other. Right? It's not that they do it periodically, that's what the British thought, that this is just what Indians do, they just kill each other for amusement. Right? No, there are reasons why riots take place and why Hindus and Muslims were involved in a struggle here. Now in this particular scene what happens is a Hindu is responsible for the killing of a Muslim boy. And Gandhi is living in that neighborhood when this killing is taking place. You know, because it's like riots, you know, people 
become enraged very often. Anger is a fundamental problem for human beings. These are all forms of anger. And so you get in a rage and he kills a, a, a Muslim boy and then he repents and he comes to Gandhi and Gandhi says to him, okay, adopt a boy and bring him up as a Muslim. He tells this Hindu, bring up a boy, you adopt a boy who has now been rendered homeless, who has been orphaned by these killings and bring him up as a Muslim in your Hindu household. And so I was asked this query, did this actually ever happen? Well, we don't really know. And I can't say I've read every Gandhi, Gandhi biography, I, and I certainly have no intention of doing that either, right? because I'll be doing nothing else in my whole life. But I have read a fair number of biographies, and I have a fairly good approximation of what Gandhi's life was like. And I think it is possible that something like this might have, might have happened. But what is important again is that this is exactly what I would have expected Mohandas Gandhi to do and to say. So therefore, we should not be detained by the consideration, did it actually happen or not? Right? That, would be, that would not be a very productive way of trying to understand how one is going to contend with certain issues. All right. So now, the South African ears. And in my concluding remarks to you, I had mentioned to you that there are these criticisms that Gandhi was a racist, right? Allegations that he was a racist, that he held a rather low opinion of black people. Allegations that he did not involve black people in the struggle. And that one I contended with immediately. And I said to you that in fact that is true. It is historically true that Gandhi did not involve black people in the struggle that even though he was fighting for the rights of the oppressed, but the oppressed is a large general category. Most of us are oppressed, right? I mean, women are oppressed, the minorities are oppressed, gay people are oppressed. So yes, he was certainly not fighting for the rights of everyone who was oppressed. And in fact, the oppressors themselves are oppressed, which is what makes it possible them to be oppressors, right? We're going to dwell on the implications of that. That there is always a dialectical relationship between, between the oppressed and the oppressor. And part of the struggle is that the oppressor has to be liberated from his worst tendencies. I mean, if one thought that World War II was simply a matter of freeing those who had been oppressed by the Nazi machinery, war machinery, propaganda machinery, ideological machinery, I think it would be a mistaken view of what, were, what that effort was about. The Germans themselves had to be emancipated from their own worst tendencies. We have to recognize that. Because freedom is, after all, indivisible. It's not possible. Most of us, 99% of us, behave as though my freedom is contingent only on what I do. If others are unfree, that's their problem. But Fundamentally, the position one will have to begin with rather is that it, you cannot be free if someone else is unfree. Right? That would be the condition of being fully and truly human. So therefore, to go back to South Africa, yes, there is no question that Gandhi did not embrace the rights of black people as part of the struggle. Did that mean that he was indifferent? Well, that would be a conclusion that one could only draw from a very careful reading of the text and of the situation. And in my view, that conclusion is not warranted. What is warranted is a view that empirically speaking, he did not say that I'm going to also take up the rights of the black man and black woman and black child. Right? And I've suggested to you that there were reasons why he didn't do so. He didn't do so largely from what I'm calling pragmatic considerations. And those pragmatic considerations were that he is in a terrain where there are already a large number of very different Indians, different linguistic groups. The merchants for whom he had been working originally 
when he was invited to South Africa, were Muslim merchants. Gandhi himself comes from a Hindu Baniya background, largely Vaishnava. Very little in common there, if you think about it. Then you have all these indentured laborers, many of them from South India, some of them from the Gangetic Plains, all speaking languages that are not Gandhi's language. They're different class interests. Right? Just getting all of them together was itself a task. Just as in India today, trying to get all Indians together, you think it's difficult enough to do it here with you know, different racial minorities, try India where you have 1,000 languages. Right? It's the same, it's, it, it, the problem on a much bigger scale in India still persists. What makes an Indian an Indian? Right? So now, and think of it this way, by the way, had Gandhi been involved in the struggle for the rights of black people, I can tell you with absolute certainty that many people ever have said, what makes Gandhi think that he speaks for the black person? You have to think always of the, the, the rejoinder as well. I, almost certainly there would have been an argument about the politics of representation. What makes Gandhi think that he can speak for black people? And I was hinting at that because that was a problem when you look at the American Civil Rights Movement, and that problem was that people like King and Bayard Rustin and James Farmer and many others wanted to be quite certain that white moderate liberals who were sympathetic did not become the voice of the Civil Rights Movement. Right? That was a central concern. So I think one will have to think about the ground realities and this is what I mean by Gandhi's understanding of the ground realities in South, in South Africa. And Gandhi understood that he had limited objectives there. Now, as to the more difficult question of whether he was a racist or not, I think it's quite likely that he was, in some respects. In some respects. And let me be very clear that I do not want to excuse him by saying that frankly that was just what everybody was at that time, which is also true. Racism was endemic. The idea that, that black people or colored people had rights, that they were right-bearing subjects was unknown anywhere in the world. And please do not tell me that the United States was a place where that idea was known. Because you wouldn't have needed a civil rights movement and you wouldn't need Black Lives Matter today if that idea that everybody is equally invested in the notion of human dignity no matter what your color or gender or whatever is, if that idea were so widely prevalent today, we wouldn't need any of these movements today either. But I don't want to excuse Gandhi on those grounds. Why? Because in many other domains, Gandhi was far ahead of his times. So if he was far ahead of his times in many other domains, then we cannot say that Gandhi was simply a creature of his times. That's usually the argument that's made. Often, for example, if somebody had a critique of Thomas Jefferson, none of the American founding fathers can be considered a paragon of equality, not even remotely, not any one of them. All right? And you know, usually the argument would be made, yes, but Jefferson and Washington, all of them had slaves, of course. Many of them slept with slave women. Right? Right? Now, you, you, you could say that, well, yeah, you know, that was the limit of the times. That was as far as you could really go when Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. So that, you see what that argument is, that he's simply reflecting the times. Right? And this would be the argument made about Gandhi. And I'm saying, frankly, no, that's not satisfactory. I think we would have to hold Gandhi up to a higher standard here. And we would have to ask this question, that if he was so radical in so many other domains, then why is it that in this respect he was not? Okay. So there are several explanations there, none of which is fully satisfying, and therefore we would have to simply suggest that yes, to some extent he was, but then we'll have to try to see. And this is where we would have to do the close reading of the text, which if we were doing a seminar, we would have the luxury of doing that for several hours with just a few passages. But I'm going to look at a couple of passages very briefly to suggest what might be some of the complications that you could think about. There is no question that Gandhi was fundamentally ignorant 
of the history of black people. There is no question about that. He was fundamentally ignorant of that history. Uh, and uh, for someone who is going to be viewed subsequently as an anti-colonial and anti-racist figure, uh, he should certainly have had to take up that obligation of informing himself, which he certainly did not. Now, he was not fundamentally ignorant about uh, other groups. As an illustration, take for example, as an illustration, take for example his acquaintance with Jews. Okay? Now, Gandhi had very nuanced views, by the way, and we'll get to that much later on, his views on Palestine. Extraordinary document that he wrote in 1938 called The Jews, in November 1938, where he takes up the whole question. Okay? Um, now, Gandhi knew Jews right from the outset. In South Africa, his private secretary, when he had a legal practice, was a Jewish woman. His closest friend and patron was Herman Kallenbach, who was Jewish. Right? And he came to an appreciation of Jewish history, which is why his position on Palestine was very complex, because he understood what the condition of Jews had been in Europe, which was not their condition in India at all. At all. India is one country where there, is n where there was never a single recorded instance of anti-Semitism. But I don't know if Gandhi knew that. But he certainly knew the history of Jews. And I'm suggesting to you that one reason why he does have the views about the black man that he did is because he was fundamentally ignorant of the history of black people all over the world whether it had to do with Africa itself or, or transportation of black people as slaves to the Americas and other parts of the world. Right? And, I, and, and the, the, there is yet a larger context here, and that larger context is that there were historical links between India and Africa which were much older than the links between India and Europe. Much older and much more productive. For example, the Indian settlements in Ethiopia that go back to a thousand years, right? On the east coast of Africa. As an illustration again. And so we're going to find that towards the end, towards the 1930s and 1940s, that Gandhi is certainly going to speak about Afro-Asiatic solidarity a lot. Okay? Right? So you'll have to, this is part of the context in which one will view this whole allegation that he was a racist. And I'm going to return, as I said, to the passages, but I'm rounding out the picture beginning that way rather than beginning with the particular. And if you round out the picture, I think we have to also consider the fact that Gandhi's views evolved. That whatever he said about black people when he was in South Africa, he certainly never said those things after his return to India and in the 1920s and 1930s and for the rest of his life. I think his views did evolve. And I think very often the criticisms simply look at what he was doing in South Africa, and that's just enough because you're saying, well, this is what he was doing in South Africa. Those were the limitations of what he was doing. But if you want to infer from that that Gandhi was a racist, well, people who are racist may outgrow their views. I think we should be prepared to accept that, that there's some people who do outgrow their views, whether they're racist or sexist or anything else for that matter. And I think it is also interesting, if you're rounding out this picture, that we would have to take into consideration two matters. One, that Gandhi was embraced by a great many African leaders and African-American leaders. Now, if Gandhi was such a racist, we'd have to concur that all these African leaders and African-American leaders, and I'm not talking about pygmies, I'm talking about people like Nelson Mandela, and Albert Luthuli, Chief Albert Luthuli, the first African to win a Nobel Prize for peace, and the person who really is the giant of the South African nonviolent movement, not, Men not Nelson Mandela. Right? I mean, Luthuli was a great admirer of Gandhi. These are all people who are well read. You look at the African American leaders, you look at Martin Luther King, James Farmer, right? Bayard Rustin. So forth and so on. Now, all of these people, you, these are people who are really well read. They know Gandhi's life. 
So clearly they themselves come around to the view that whatever Gandhi may have said about the black person at one point in time, that this is not the Gandhi that they recognize. That this is not what Gandhi stood for fundamentally, eventually. Right? I think this is important because it also suggests that they understood that Gandhi had in fact actually evolved his view. It's very interesting that in 1936, when Gandhi is staying in a place called Sevagram in central India, this is his new ashram, the new community where he has established himself, he is visited by an African American delegation. The delegation is led by Howard Thurman, so the, m most of the people who were part of this delegation were African American leaders, either churchmen, major figures in the United States at that point. This is well before the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, though remember 1936. Or they were educators, President of Morehouse College, historically black college, right? And they came and they spent several days with Gandhi and their conversation with Gandhi is recorded. It's in the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. And what transpires during this conversation? At the end of the conversation, Gandhi says to Howard Thurman, he says, it is very likely that the next great experiment in nonviolent resistance will be carried out by your people in America. In 1936. Right? You, you, can, you can look at it in the collected works. Now, you see, so I think that that shows his fundamental respect for Africans, rather than suggesting that he was, in fact, really a racist. But let's look at a couple of the passages from Satyagra in South Africa, very briefly, before I turn to one or two uh, movements okay, in uh, South Africa. And then from there, we turn to India. Right? Because eventually, of course, we're going to find that this is where Gandhi's main terrain of activity is going to be. Page 9, his Satyagra in South Africa. Let me read the passage and we'll parse it as an illustration. And this is what I meant, that we could do this for several hours with one or two of these, but briefly. Before the advent of European civilization, the Negroes used to wear animal skins, which also served them as carpets, bedsheets, and quilts. Nowadays, they use blankets. Before British rule, men as well as women moved about almost in a state of nudity. Now, you see, if you read this and you're not interpreting, you know, you'll say Gandhi's a racist. Why? Because he's saying, oh, these guys are savages. They move about in a state of nudity, right? That's how a person might read it if they're not really reading it with a degree of self-reflexivity. Let's see what he says. Even now, many do the same in the country. They cover the private parts with a piece of skin. Some people dispense with this. I also want to, as a little interjection here, point out to you that he is not writing this when he was there. He's writing this when? In 1928. 1928. He has long been back in India. He's looking back on the struggle there, recording okay, his memories, his insights, what all of that. So keep that, keep that in mind. This is, he's writing back in, he's writing in 1928 now. But let not anyone infer. I'm quoting him now. See, if you had read the first five lines and stopped there, or if you quoted only that, you would come to a very different conclusion about what's happening here now. Now he continues, they cover the private parts with a piece of skin, some dispense even with this, but let not anyone infer from this that these people cannot control their senses. Just because they're running around naked, it doesn't mean they're all sexually attacking each other. Right? You see, and of course he's doing something which is highly significant, which I'm going to point to in a minute. Where a large society follows a particular custom, it is quite possible that the custom is harmless, even if it seems highly improper to the members of another society. Right? I mean, I, I, and I, you, you remember, of course, that, that when the Europeans saw them, okay, in the late 1890s, when Gandhi was there, let's imagine you've got Europeans there too at that point in time. They say, hey, look at these black people. They run around. They've got virtually nude. 
they just cover their private parts a little bit, and that's it. And, right? and of course, the Europeans would have said, hey, this is, this is savagery. This is primitivism. Right? Okay? Now, ironically, of course, you've got, you know, and you, go to, you go to Durban, or you, or, or you go to Cape Town, and you go to the beaches, and you've got all these white people with vir virtually nothing on. <laughs> right? With virtually nothing on, not to mention California and you know, nude beaches and this and that. Right? Now, that's perfectly fine. But when these people are nude, no, that's barbarism, that's savagery, that's primitivism. You s and of course, now they blame the black people because they say, hey, these people, you know, they don't appreciate this. You know, the life on the beach, so forth and so on. Why are they always overdressed? You see how interesting politics here? Think of it. Right? Okay, now these Negroes have no time see, to be staring at one another. You know, it's, it's such an odd line, it seems that way. But he's saying that, look, we have to understand what nudity means. The idea that a, a, a woman who is nude should be viewed simply as a sexualized being. He says this idea doesn't exist in that society. This is a European problem. That if you see a nude woman, uh, the only thing you can think of is, okay, sex. He said that's... They actually don't think that way. You see, now I want to know, is Gandhi being a racist here? I want to know that, right? When Sukhdev passed by the side of women, this is an incident from, from an Indian text, but we'll read it. When Sukhdev passed by the side of women bathing in a state of nudity, so the author of the Bhagavata, that's a, that's a sacred scripture, tells us his own mind was quite unruffled. It did not disturb him when he saw all these women bathing in the nude. Nor were the women at all agitated or affected by a sense of shame. I do not think that there is anything supernatural in this account. Right? See, you, you, we'll have to pause and think about, and you know Gandhi himself is going to eventually embrace what you might call nudity. I mean, you look at how he's dressed. We're going to see that in the slides. I'm going to show you where one way to write a biography of Gandhi. No one's done that yet. I've thought about doing it for many years, but it's one of 100 projects, right? A sartorial biography of Gandhi, by which I mean you simply look at how he was dressed at a certain point in his life. Because Mohandas Gandhi is the only person in history about whom I can say with confidence that he began his life, adult life, vastly overdressed and ended it vastly underdressed. Right? All he wore was a basically a, a loincloth and sometimes in the winter he would put a shawl around his shoulders. But the vast majority of photographs you're going to see of him, you'll see, right, he walks around with a bare chest. But when he goes to England, read the autobiography. What does he do? He apes the Englishman. He overdresses. Everybody in Europe overdressed in the late 19th century. You look at the women, you know, the, the number of layers underneath their skirt, you know, all right? Everybody overdressed. And, you know, he says he got himself a top hat and coattails. He was trying to look like an Englishman, you know, walking like a duck with all that stuff on him, right? That's, that's what he was doing. And then gradually, what does he do? Gradually, he starts to strip himself. Start, starts taking off things. As he stripped himself of all the different needs in life, all the things that people thought were essential. And so Gandhi said, I can do without this. I can do without that. He strips himself. Now when you strip yourself, and the argument I made before, you reduce yourself to zero. Right? You reduce yourself to zero. And when you reduce yourself to zero, then you become a receptacle for divine love. That's how Gandhi is going to be thinking. But there are places where he'll say, there are places where he'll certainly say, let's take another incident where he says, the black man is, you know, a kafir. Okay? You know, he seems uncivil he's uncivilized. Okay, I'll get to you in just one second. Let me just finish this strand of thought. Well, but let's see. So, for example, page 11 of this book, Satyagra in South Africa, the first new paragraph, 
civilization is gradually making headway among the Negroes. Now you think to yourself, ah, so Gandhi, this shows his racism, right? Because he now is saying, hey, finally civilization has entered, okay, the life of the Negro through the Europeans, but civilization is in quotation marks. It's in quotation marks because he's questioning, what do we mean by civilization? Pious missionaries deliver to them the message of Christ as if they have understood it, right? That, that's what it means to become civilized, right? That you now become, you know, you, the teachings of Christ are given to you. He is, in fact, actually questioning all of this. But many who, being illiterate and therefore strangers to civilization, were so far free from many vices, have now become corrupt. Now that they become civilized, they become corrupt. Hardly any Negro who has come in contact with civilization has escaped the evil of drink. Right? You go on and on. So we are going to have to parse what he means. And the last comment, and then I'll take the question and move on to the next thing. The last comment apropos of this, when he is in South Africa, so there's a book that has come out very recently, in fact written by two friends of mine, uh, and I'm still friends with them even though I don't agree with the arguments of the book as such. Uh, it's called Gandhi, the stretcher bearer of empire. Right? So it, 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 the, the stretcher bearer is taken from the expression that w when Gandhi was in South Africa, there were a couple of wars in which he volunteered not to fight. He volunteered as a nurse. Okay? As a nurse during the Boer War. So the Boer War is a war fought from 1898 until about 1902. Brutal war. And it's a war really between the Boers, the Dutch, and the English. And it will eventually lead to English supremacy and what is called the Union of South Africa, right? Eventually, it will lead to that. This war, by the way, is a crucial war in world history because many of the methods, uh, many, of, many things that we call war crimes were pioneered in this war. The use of concentration camps, right, was pioneered in this war. The Boers were all herded together, including women and children. Non-combatants, in other words, they were all herded together, put in camps. Which is, of course, we know the later history of concentration camps, right? Um, you, you know, the use of taxes, tactics to intimidate entire populations, terrorize populations, including non-combatants. This was all practiced widely in the Boer War. It was also practiced, of course, in the American Civil War. Uh, in some cases, the burning of Atlanta would be an illustration of that. But, but nonetheless, the Boer War is the context we are interested in because Gandhi is very much there. What does he do? He says, I'm going to offer my services to the British. Why is he offering his services to the British as a stretcher bearer, as part of an ambulance corps? Because fundamentally, at that point, he adopted the view that Indians had to fight to get their rights as British subjects. Within the empire, Indians should be treated equally along with the British. He's not making an argument against the British Empire at this time. He is not an anti-colonialist. And I think those who are reading his anti-colonialism from India back to South Africa are obviously making a mistake here. He is unequivocally clear that he believes that within the empire, within the British Empire, there is a hierarchy. Why is there a hierarchy? Why are Indians not being given the same treatment as the white people, as the people of white dominions such as Canada? Australia, New Zealand, these are white dominions, correct? Right? So, so Gandhi is saying that within the empire we should be treated equally. And even that is not happening. And the reason he's also raising the ambulance corps is it goes back to the question of duty and rights. That before we can claim rights as British subjects, well, we ought to perform our duty as British subjects. Now, I'm not going to perform my duty, he says, I'm not going to volunteer for the war because I don't believe in violence. But if a war is being fought, I can certainly volunteer my services as a nurse, which is what he did. And of course, it is possible to argue 
as some people have argued, that he was therefore complicit in the project of empire. Right Now you can see how the criticisms are formed. But one would have to really review the situation very carefully, parse the text, and try to come to an understanding of what it is that Gandhi was attempting to do. I, I didn't hear the last word. Uh, have I read criticisms that do what? That claim that Gandhi believes in scientific criticism. Scientific criticism. Racism. Racism. Scientific racism. Yeah. Oh, no. Like no, no, no. no. I, 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 don't, I, I don't think there's any shred of evidence to suggest that Gandhi... Uh, by the way, I don't even know what scientific racism is because that's an oxymoron, right? Uh, by which you understand what I mean, that, that racism itself is... There, there's no basis in science at all, but I know what you mean. What you mean is that there were people in the 19th century who were claiming that there was a scientific basis to racism, just as there are people who today, you know, the bell curve, for example, some of, you know, some of you here may not know that, but anyhow, there was this whole thing about the bell curve. You know, that people who claim that you can establish that there is a difference between the brains of black people and white people or, you know, Asians, whatever the case might be, uh, no, I, I don't think there's, 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 uh, there's really any evidence to suggest that Gandhi, uh, you know, b believed that there was a scientific basis for racism. I think his ignorance stems from the fact, and I think that, that happens often, but this is where, as I'm saying, one cannot exculpate him, one cannot excuse him for that, while recognizing that everyone else was, of course, saying the same thing, but nonetheless, right? It, ignorance stems from the fact that Gandhi looked at black people around him too. It was not only his ignorance of their history. Right? He looked at the black people around him. None of these people were in a position that would command the respect of someone. Right? Let me use that phrase which I really detest, frankly, but it's used in pop psychology all the time and it's prevalent on every university campus in this country, role model, right? If you were a black person, what were your role models? How many black lawyers were there? The only people, black people, that Gandhi saw around him, with a few exceptions, were people who were in the doldrums. They belonged to the lowest strata of society because that's what they had been reduced to and that is very often what people do you make inferences from what you see around you right? that was part of the problem but I want to be unequivocally clear I'm, I'm, I'm giving you illustrations and I'm reading that look there are arguments about yeah you know he believed they were inferior so forth and so on I'm suggesting that I think the case is more complicated, even with respect to that, even with respect to that. And then, of course, you get to the larger geopolitical argument. The larger geopolitical argument has to do with the fact that, well, Gandhi, if, if Gandhi held to views that were so consistently racist with respect to black people, um, then why is it that African leaders and African-American leaders have all embraced it. Right? I think we would have to look at that and we would also have to look at what he wrote and said about Afro-Asiatic solidarity and things like that. All right so this is you know these are not conclusive because it's a chapter it, it's a whole course in itself Gandhi's years in South Africa and what he was doing there because after all he lived 20 years. 20 years is a very long period of time but his his uh, Time in India is even longer. And it is to that we shall now turn. Because Gandhi is going to leave. I did have, I did intend to discuss a whole campaign in South Africa, but I think we're going to have to really move to, to what he's going to be doing in India um, and uh, the advent of nonviolent resistance campaigns in India. Uh, I can only tell you as an illustration once again, very briefly, rather than doing a long discussion of it, that one of the, for example, 
uh, campaigns that he conducted in South Africa uh, furnishes some clues to how he was thinking. So this was what was called the Asiatic Registration, the Campaign Against Asiatic Registration Laws. It's in Satyagraha in South Africa. Uh, if you go to page 92, that's where the discussion uh, of that begins. Uh, so they had passed a law. What was the law? The law that they had passed was it required all persons of Asian origin to register themselves. Required them. Did not require white people to do that, of course. Right? It would be something similar to what Donald Trump would do here, or even Cruz for that matter. All Muslims should be registered. Right? Cruz, they've, they've said so much. They've said as much, both of them, in one way or the other. Right? They should register. And we know, of course, uh, that if only that community is being targeted, then that's what discrimination means. That's what an unjust law means when one community is targeted. Right? Now, so this was all Asians must register, and moreover, they should submit fingerprints. Now, you see, when you're in 2016, you don't think anything of submitting fingerprints because it's become normalized. Things that were exceptional. The only people whose fingerprints were taken at that time were criminals. Your fingerprints were never taken anywhere in the world unless you were a criminal. Today, it's common. It shows you how far the state has entered into the domain of everyone's lives. We will all be criminalized, by the way. We are all potentially criminals. You should understand that. That's the nature of the modern state. Okay? So, so Gandhi understands that, yes? So, so only, like, Asian, like, are you talking about, like, Indians only, or, like, Asians in general? Oh, but, but they were mainly, they were mainly. No, Asiatic registration, Asi the word Asians is used in South Africa as it is used in Britain even today. Asians in Britain really means Indians and Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. Of course, Asian includes, right, Chinese, Vietnamese, you know, Korean, right? It's like, Asian, there are different usages and there are the histories of those usages. In, in the United States, I hold a joint appointment in Asian American Studies, so I know the history of that. It, Asian American Studies in the United States meant East Asian. It meant Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, Korean Americans, it did not include South Asian Americans, like myself, Indian Americans, it did not. Then, of course, there was a struggle to make that term more expansive, right? So that now Asian American studies, you have a component which in includes Indian American, but predominantly Asian American always meant East Asian in, in this context here. In Britain, in South Africa, Asian meant Indian and Pakistani. Post 47, there were no Pakistanis in 1890. The country didn't exist. Pakistan didn't exist, right? Okay, so Asian registration, and in any case, the fundamental problem was Indians. Indians, okay? So you, you, had, to, you had to now submit your fingerprints. Now, when Gandhi reads about this, he, of course, understands. If you read Satyagra in South Africa, page 93, he tells you that fingerprinting, the history is it's only used for criminals. The, what is, the implication is every Indian is a criminal. That's the implication. So he says we must resist. He, we must resist. Okay? And they're going to have a big meeting on September 11th. September 11th. Note the date. If you were to write an alternative history of 9-11, you should think of that. Okay? Right? I never call it 9-11 because to call it 9-11 is to accept the American narrative of that. Right? I call it September 11th. There, there, September 11th is an important date in many other places too. And I've given you one illustration of the importance of that. That's when Satyagraha is going to be launched in South Africa. At the Empire Theater in Johannesburg. They have a meeting of all the Indians. I'm not going to tell you the whole outcome. It looks like a complete surrender and compromise on the part of Gandhi. That's what it looks like from a certain standpoint. And in order to understand that, I want to read out a passage from a very different text, a very, very short passage, just a line, essentially, so that you understand what is involved when we begin to look at these nonviolent movements. Okay? 
Um, what is the essential basis on which one has to start thinking about a non-violence movement? And the passage I want to read out to you is from, um, I, I had marked it and somehow I've lost it. It's a passage actually from Martin Luther King, uh, either from the letter from Birmingham jail or his great speech at Riverside Church in 1967 uh, against the Vietnam War. Um, I, I can't find it right now, but I'll alert you to it. B basically what the passage says is that whenever there is a conflict, we must always think about the give and take from both sides. The give and take from both sides. So in this case, in the Asiatic registration, right, the first compromise, the Gandhi and, and a group of Indians are going to go to the commanding officer, the, 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 the governor, and say that this law is unjust. We're not going to register. So then they have to try to reach a compromise. That's the give and take. Okay. How do we do it? Right? The Brit they're, they're very firm. And so one of the things that the British are going to say is, eventually, at Gandhi's suggestion, it's not going to be a law. It won't be a law. We expect you to register, but we won't require it. Now, is that a victory or not? Or is that simply saying, well, it was just a change of the language, right? So these are the things that you'd have to think about. Because what we think is simply a change of language may very well be different. And I'll give you again a different illustration. I'm, I'm deliberately crossing temporal lines here so you can see th the argument, okay? So for example, in 1930, when Gandhi leads the Salt March, which we'll look at in greater detail later on. The following the end of the salt march, the British are going to negotiate with Gandhi directly. And it's very often been charged by Gandhi's critics that he gave away everything at the negotiation. Okay, that fundamentally he walked away with empty hands. Well, see, this is where you have to start reading history differently. Because the fact that the British negotiated with him in the first place is important. And the person who understood that and understood the implications, because when you negotiate with a person across the table, in principle, you have now allowed for equality. In principle, you have per allowed that, you see. And so the person who understood the significance of this was Gandhi's greatest opponent, Winston Churchill, right? The man celebrated in America as a great savior along with FDR of, you know, world civilization, right? World War II, you know, his heroism and so on. The guy was an outright racist, Churchill, outright racist. I mean, that's, for someone like him, the word racist applies because he didn't think that people outside the European world were fit to be free and independent. And you know what he said? When the news was announced that Gandhi was going to have negotiations and when Gandhi walked up the steps of the viceregal palace to meet with the viceroy, Churchill said, it is a nauseating and disgusting spectacle to see a half naked fakir walk up the steps of the viceregal palace to parley on equal terms with the representative of the king emperor. What does fakir mean? Fakir is a holy man. It is a disgusting and nauseating spectacle. That's what Churchill said. You see, so this is why we will have to again understand what is involved when you enter into a non-violent campaign. And, you know, I get petitions all the time, you know, students come, uh, will you sign this petition? And, you know, every petition, it, it, it always says, we demand, we demand. Everybody's demanding. Nobody wants to surrender even an iota. You know, the students, we demand this, we demand that. Well, let's try to understand what does it mean to demand? Okay, 
Maybe the demand is unreasonable. Maybe it's overstated. Maybe you shouldn't demand so much. Right? These are going to be important things if we're going to understand the nature of a nonviolent struggle. All right? So now, Gandhi returns to India, January 1915. World War I has just broken out a few months ago. He leaves South Africa. And by the way, indentured servitude is abolished around this time. Technically 1917, but by 1910 it had stopped. I don't want to say that Gandhi played the biggest role in it, but he had a hand in playing a role in it. There was a man called a very close friend of his, C.F. Andrews, Charlie Freer Andrews, a British missionary who then actually, who lived in India his, his entire adult life. One of those Britishers who went over, as they say, to the other side, okay, um, became a very, very close associate of Gandhi, and he's remembered uh, in, in, in India still today. Uh, he was, he, he wrote actively and vigorously against the whole practice of indentured labor, which I've spoken to you about, the migration of these people, the conditions under which they worked, that whole system is going to be abolished, right, uh, around 1910 to 1917. And Gandhi certainly, as I said, had a bit of a role to play in that as well. Now here's the problem. Before we begin to consider the campaigns in India of nonviolent resistance, the problem is Gandhi comes back to India He's not really a known entity. He is not unknown. Let me be very clear. I'm not suggesting that he was, you know, somebody who was not on anybody's radar screen. No, he's, he's known. He's known because he has struggled for the rights of Indians, at least, or a certain class of Indians, if you want to be really critical and say he struggled only for the rights of a certain class of Indians in South Africa. but. Uh, what he was doing had been reported in the newspapers. And there were links between India and South Africa. There were Indian politicians who were going to South Africa. Uh, one such man was a man called Gopal Krishna Gokhale. And Gandhi had met Gokhale in South Africa. He had come, and Gandhi had come to India a couple of times in between too. It's not as though he had been completely cut off from the homeland, but on short visits, on short visits. And so when I say that he's returning unknown, what I mean by that is that by and large, he is not known to the masses. He is known only to some elites who are reading the newspapers, who are following the history of the struggle of Indians in South Africa. Right? Most people in India didn't have the luxury to do that. They, they had to think about the struggle there. And of course, the vast majority of Indians were not literate anyhow. So he is in that sense really an unknown entity. But he has political aspirations. He has political aspirations because that's what he's done. He's certainly not going to come back to India and establish a law practice because he had really ceased to practice law in the last few years of his life in South Africa. So what is his calling going to be? Right? It's like, you know, when you, when you fill out a form and says profession, what's your profession? You know, I'm a university teacher, you know, I'm a salesman, uh, arms dealer. I've even, uh, arms dealer, right, profession. So what is Gandhi's profession going to be? Freedom fighter, right? Think of it, right? This is, you know, you have to, you'll have to imagine, right? He's coming back. What does he have to do? He has to establish himself. He has to make himself into a known enti entity. So Gopal Krishna Gokhale says, acquaint yourself, reacquaint yourself with the land of your birth. Spend one year traveling. And that's what Gandhi does. He spends one year traveling. Right? He travels by third class train. He goes from village to village, small towns, getting to know the country, getting to know the people there. And mind you, that when he comes back to India, he is not stepping into a political vacuum, by which I mean that there was already on the ground a nationalist struggle against British rule by this time. In fact, in some places, a very concerted struggle. And in some places, you had armed revolutionaries. The British called them terrorists, of course. The Indians called them revolutionaries, armed revolutionaries, right? And what was a campaign that armed revolutionaries would carry out? If you identify a British official 
who's particularly oppressive, you target him for assassination, right? You sabotage railway lines. Those are the kinds of things that you do. You try to, you try to imperil colonial rule to the extent that you can. And these were very small measures undertaken by a handful of people here and there. That's what it was. But, but on the other hand, you had a party called the Indian National Congress. I spoke to you about it, founded in 1885. Now, when he returns, it's 30 years since the organization was founded. By then, it has grown. It is no longer an organization simply of 60 or 70 lawyers, which is, which is, which is what it was at the outset. Now it has several thousand members, and there are certainly people in India at this time, such as a man by the name of uh, Tilak, Bal Gangardhar Tilak. So Tilak was, I want to mention, talk about him just for a minute or two, because I think it's important to understand what somebody like him is doing. So Tilak was a Maharashtrian. He came from West India, Western India, uh, the state adjoining the state that Gandhi came from, well, what, what is Gujarat. And Bal Gangadhar Tilak was what you might call a militant nationalist, but a highly educated man, like Gandhi himself, by the way, a lawyer. Uh, take it from me, by the way, unless I tell you to the, ex uh, to the contrary, that every Indian I'm speaking about here, uh, you know, when I'm speaking about them, they're all lawyers, all of them. Every single person is trained in law, okay? So unless I tell you to the contrary, just assume that they are that. Now, Bal Gangadhar Telak, and you know, that's, why is it important? Here's a little note on something you can write a whole book on. Because the Indian nationalist, as we will see, when we look at Gandhi's trial in 1922, he's going to be put on trial in 1922, the Indians were able to command the courtroom. Let me explain what I mean by that. The person who first showed that was Tilak. He showed that. That this idea of an adversarial legal system was an English invention that came to India. Right? So the prosecution establishes its case, then the defense establishes its case. That's the adversarial system that you have in the United States as well. Right? The Indians mastered it. They mastered it and they were able to turn the tables on the British. This upsets the British because they are showing the British that we can do what you do better than you can. But to command a courtroom also means other things. It means to command the rhetorical strategies. Understand also that the courtroom is a public spectacle. These are spectacles of empire. Recall, well, this happens before your time, except the few people here. O.J. Simpson, right? The courtroom is a public spectacle. That's what it is. Now, Gandhi understood that. And, and one significance of that, so one is simply the fact that all of these people being trained in the law meant that if the British were using the law against them, they also understood the finer points of the law, the Indians themselves. But it also means that they actually mastered this domain, right? This particular domain. And understood, thirdly, that if you were going to wage a movement of whatever kind, it is very important. And this is a hundred years before the present day that I'm talking about. It is very important that you be able to get the public on your side. I mean, th this, this, is the, this is the problem for ISIS, <coughs> right? That they have to be able to command public support. Whatever the nature of the movement, this is, of course, ISIS is, of course, as far removed as you can get from this, you know, indiscriminate use of violence, frankly, right? Brutal in its own way. But, but what we are saying is that there are some things that are in common here. Now, Tilak is a lawyer. He commands the courtroom. He's going to be put on trial twice on charges of treason and sedition, waging war against the government of India established by law. Of course, that's a fiction, right? Because the government of India is a British government. That's not established by law. It's established by theft. That's what it is. But once, once a fiction has gone on for 100 years, it becomes the law. 
So this is what we're speaking of over here, that he's going to be put on trial. You read the transcripts. It's amazing. The, his command of the language, the command of the courtroom, the rhetorical strategies, Gandhi is observant. He's watching. All right? And the difference between Tilak and Gandhi, however, was that Tilak also believed that violence was perfectly justified if necessary. So he does not accept him as a mentor, but he accepts him as someone who is obviously a political patriot. And so when I'm saying to you that when Gandhi comes in 1915, it is important to understand that he is not stepping into a political vacuum. There is a movement, there are leaders such as Tilak who command the adoration of the country, or at least large segments of the country. All right? And we're going to see how that is going to be multiplied by a factor of 10 when it comes to Gandhi, right? The way in which he commanded the masses, the way in which he transformed. The Indian National Congress was still an organization of elites, even though Tilak himself had a mass following, but he did not transform the Congress in the same way. When Gandhi is going to come into power in India, Right? He is going to transform the Congress. It's going to become a mass organization with two, three million members. It had more members than any political party in the world, including the Chinese Communist Party, okay? under the early years of Mao. And so a, a question which has never been fully resolved in the Gandhi scholarship, and I'm not going to attempt to resolve it because we're not really going to attempt to answer every question there, but it is still not clear how Gandhi returning to India in January 1915 within four, four and a half years is going to become the undisputed leader of the whole nationalist movement. Because remember, he's been out of India for a long time, right? And he is going to be able to establish himself as the person who is really at the helm. There's just no question about that. Whether you like him or hate him, even his critics have to admit that the manner in which he, and it's not clear. You know, there used to be a traditional theory, and this is what I mean when I say it's never been resolved. So if you were a traditional American political scientist, what would you say? You would say, ah, Gandhi had charisma. Charisma is absolutely useless, if you ask me. It's just one of these ideas that's available, right? It's there in this little box, you take it out. Okay, so whenever you want to explain how somebody like Gandhi, uh, he had charisma, you know. And third world leaders in any case are supposed to have charisma because they don't use their brain, they simply have charisma, right, to command an audience. All these African despots and strong men, they all had charisma. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that charisma is what's going to explain uh, how these leaders were able to acquire power and such a following. And certainly in the case of Gandhi, Gandhi was not what you would call charismatic, okay? He was not charismatic. Uh, uh, Barack Obama, I've, I've read an endless number of times that he has charisma, he may, uh, and he's uh, a commanding, imposing figure, tall, lanky, you know, everything a handsome man is supposed to be. Gandhi is certainly not that. He had large Mickey Mouse ears, as somebody said, uh, and he was described as being positively ugly by a number of contemporary observers, all right? Uh, all the things that are not calculated to make you charismatic, believe me, right? So this is a question, fundamental question, which, as I said, we're not going to attempt to resolve. So he comes back, he travels for a year. One of the first things he does, he gives a speech at Banana Sindhu University. Amazing document, right? What is, what is the speech? I'm telling you the context in which he's going to now emerge, so Banaras Hindu University was a university that had just been founded. And there was an inauguration of the university. And so Gandhi is invited. Now it's interesting. He's only been back in India for a year, but he's now being invited. He's starting to make him, his presence known. Right? So he's invited, and what does he do? He embarrasses everybody, including his hosts. Why? Because the first thing he tells them is, it's a shame that I'm giving a speech in the city called Banaras, which Mark Twain de described as the oldest city in the world, older than history. 
as Mark Twain said in his inimitable style, older than history. Right? Also, it's, officially, it's known as Varanasi. That's the other name by which it's known. Right? So it's center of the Hindu cosmos and all of that. Um, so he says, it's a shame that I arrive in this city, the center of Indian civilization, as some people know it, and everyone who has spoken before me has spoken in English. Why are we all speaking in English? Here's a university that's being founded. It is supposed to signal the renaissance of Indian learning. And we're so colonized that every single one of us is giving speeches in English. Right? And you know, and you, you read the record of that time. So the people who are seated at the podium, you know, all the distinguished guests within there, say, stop it, stop it, stop it. Mohandas, Mr. Gandhi, you can't, can't, this is very embarrassing. Because the British Viceroy is seated there, you know, right? And because, because now, you see, when he's criticizing that, he's also criticizing, of course, a number of things tacitly. The use of English in India overwhelmingly by the elites. The, because because un, try to understand the implications. The implication is, how are we going to develop as a nation when we're speaking in a language which is spoken by 0.001% of the population at that time? No, 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 it's not the common language. That's what I, it's spoken by 0.001% of the population. That, that makes it a common language? That it only makes it the common language for the highly anglicized elites. That's all it does. It is not the common language. At, and remember, we're talking about 1916, a hundred years ago. Okay. And then he says, ah, you know, all these princes who are seated at the podium. Why do they have so many jewels on them? You know, these... He says that in the speech. I mean, it created an uproar. You see, you knew somebody who was a dissenter of a different kind had now entered the Indian scene. That's what's happened. Because he's saying, I'm, I'm feeling uncomfortable. This is my own country. This university is supposed to represent the efflorescence the, of Indian civilization, new phase in the history of India, we've been a colonized people, we still are colonized, yet we all speak only English. We only address others who speak English. How are we going to speak to our countrymen and women? See, he's saying all of that. Now, he goes to, a couple of minutes, he goes to the annual meeting of the Indian National Congress. So the Indian, Indian National Congress has an annual meeting. At the annual meeting, he is approached by a man whose name is Shukla. And Shukla says to Gandhi, we need your help. We need your help. This is how he is entering into Indian politics. But he is also following Gokhale's advice because what had Gokhale told him? Acquaint yourself with the country. Get to know the conditions under which people live. And Shukla says, I come from a place called Champaran. I'll show you some slides next time of that area. Okay. This is where Indians were indigo farmers. Some of you may not know what indigo means. Indigo is a dye. It's a dye. So it's a dye used, for example, for textiles. What is indigo? In other words, it's a cash crop. You can't live off indigo. Well, you can live off it only in the way that if you were making huge profits. But what these people are doing is they are, of course, the indigo farmers are farming for the owner, the plantation owner. And they are getting a miserable amount of money by which they eke out their living. And much of that they have to then use to buy grains that you can eat. You can't eat indigo after all. This is, by the way, a common problem in agriculture even today. That the people who are growing food for others, and they're usually growing cash crops, sugar, you know, right? Indigo. So he says to Gandhi, the conditions of the farmers are miserable. Indigo farmers, we want you to come and help organize us. 
Now you see, he's being approached by somebody. Somebody has heard that, hey, here's a man who's willing to do something for the masses. So Gandhi decides to go to Champaran. That's the Champaran Satyagraha, which is going to be launched on 10th April 1917. And what we're going to do in my following lecture is I'm going to take you through the steps very briefly. Now we could do this for each Satyagraha campaign. There are just too many. We will do it for only one. So you see the steps. We'll do it for this maybe and the Ahmedabad briefly, the Ahmedabad labor Satyagraha. I want to read, have you read these two to see what are the steps. So for example, when he goes to Champaran, what is he going to do? He is first going to say, I cannot take Mr. Shukla's word for what he is saying. This is how he is representing the situation. I need to find out for myself. He is going to conduct a massive inquiry there. He's going to sit there literally at a table with assistants and they're going to take depositions. Each farmer is going to come to them and going to say, this is the problem. They're going to write it all down. They're going to take depositions. You first establish the facts on the ground. That's a problem with all these petitions that demand that I give. They, they don't bother to establish the facts on the ground. They just assume they know everything. You first establish the facts on the ground. That is the first step of a non-violent campaign. And we're going to see how he's going to build up on that. If you get a chance, see the Gandhi film. Uh, I've never recommended that before. I think because there are episodes such as these which you'll find. Okay, and as I said, you can easily get it on YouTube, Netflix. I, the, the, they have it at Hare Powell and, and the audio visual library. You can go watch it there if you get a chance. Not required, but if you get a chance. And remember, give me that assignment which is due on Tuesday. Okay, one or two pages. All right, and I hope that that when you write that, that the preceding 24 hours or whenever you've conducted that little experiment on yourself will be, will be productive for you in some ways. Okay, 